All right, Uncle Sam FM here, and this is episode three of the American Football Series. And a couple things first. Um, I had planned on this being a live com of the U.S. Open Cup Final. However, while I was playing the U.S. Open Cup Final, uh, I was interrupted. And so I had to stop recording, and it kind of... The game was going well. I really didn't want to stop it and restart the game. So um, I decided to, uh, to go ahead, play it out, and whatever happened, happened. If I lost, then I come in here and tell you that I lost. If I won, I come here and tell you that I won. Um, and so so that's kind of the deal. I, I, I knew I probably should have just recorded the game separate and then done a comm here, but I, I guess I prefer... A, a big a cup final like that I you know prefer doing a live com so that well just it's more intense right rather than doing a um, you know commenting on a video so <clears throat> so what, we'll, what I figured I would do is we'll, we'll look at how you know where I'm at as of September 23rd in the game and um, you know we'll look at the result of the open cup final I did uh, record the all-star game so I figured we'll, I'll just calm the All-Star Game video, and um, that'll be the episode. Um, so first of all, looking at the squad, it's been kind of a... There's a couple of... Um, I didn't, it wasn't a huge injury crisis, but in a way it was because I lost a couple of really important players. So uh, Adam Lungvist took an injury, and it was a pretty bad one. Um, I don't remember. I had... Uh, I don't remember exactly what the injury was. I don't remember where it says there, but um, I think you can look at in injury history, right? So that broke an ankle, right? And he was out three months. Um, I also lost, and he's my left back, my starting left back. And I also lost Garcia. Let's see what his injury was. Hip injury. And he was out for five weeks. So, and I didn't, in MLS and football manager, when you have an injury that's for a significant amount of time, it'll ask you if you want to put him on the disabled list. I didn't select either for either player. So, well, and what it is, in the disabled list takes them off your squad, off your roster. For you can choose either six games, you can put them on the six game disabled list, or you can put them on the season ending disabled list. Um, neither of the guys looked like they were going to be out the entire season so I, I would certainly was not going to put them out for the entire season um but i also i, I i've kind of gotten burned choosing the six game disabled list before because what's happened is i'll uh, if i choose to make a change to the squad for example well like lungfist so lungfist is an international player if I put him on the disabled list, that takes him off the squad and it opens up a slot. It opens up an international slot. And so what I've done in the past is I've brought in an international player to kind of fill that gap for guys who are gone for <clears throat> an extended period of time. But I really didn't want to do that here. Um, at least right away I did it. I, you know, In the moment, I didn't want to make a decision on whether or not I was going to bring somebody in. So... I was I didn't dis, I wasn't going to dis, put either on the disabled list, but the game apparently chose for me to put them on the season-ending disabled list, so they're both out uh, for the whole season, and that's really frustrating. But it is what it is. There's not really much I can I can do about it now. You know, it's spilled milk. Um, Wenger also got hurt, and so because of the issues with Garcia and Lundqvist, I did put him on the six-game disabled list. I didn't want to lose him for the season. He's just a backup, so you know Wenger, so he's not that important. But um, so I, so boom, right there, my right back and my left back out for the year. So I'm kind of in a bit of a pickle. Um, on, at left back, I have Dylan Remick. <clears throat> he's not great. I mean, he's not not like he. Uh, you can see there his. You know his stats. Technicals are are on the low side of average. Mentals low side of average. Physicals meh. So you know he's he's not that great. But I, I in a pinch he can do right. I can just slot him in at left back. Take away some of his um, tactical instructions in the game. Like you know make him um, 
fewer risky passes, all that kind of thing. Put him in a situation where he could be successful and he'll be adequate, right? Um, and then I also have at left back, I have a backup, uh, Jordan, who <clears throat> he's not good right now. Okay, let's just say that. He's, you know, right now he's not good, but he's got three and a half star potential, which is serviceable. And so I figure I'll just let Remix be the, my number one left back. And Jordan will get games that he would not have normally gotten to help his development. Because I do feel like he will eventually turn into a player who can contribute or who, who at least has enough value for me to trade and get something out of him or sell. Um, so left back, I decided not to touch anything. Right back, though, the only I have Marky Delgado, who is good. Well, okay, so he's okay, right? He he's I can he's a little better than Remick, right? So I can start him at right back and still feel comfortable with it. Um, but my only other right back without Garcia is Sheldon Sullivan, who is not good at all, and he's not ever going to be any good. So there's. I wanted to bring somebody in who was either going to step in and be a number one or who could I could at least be developing. So I looked through what my scouts um, had found on, in, you know, and I've got six scouts, I think, well, five out searching for players. Um, and I had one scout in Central Europe looking for loan targets. <clears throat> and they brought me this guy, Luis Orajuela who is a right back he uh he comes from ajax um and he's you know he's pretty good and they were offering him for a loan they were looking for a loan situation for him so i brought him in um i wouldn't mind bringing him in permanently he is he does have four star potential he's you know he's got decent stats everywhere i expect, i do kind of like his passing rating um so i went and brought him in it did cost me a lot on my um general allocation money because he would have put me over the salary cap and so when that happens you either have to drop somebody or you have to use your general allocation money to pay down somebody's contract so i had to give up most of my allocation money. i don't normally like doing that in the first season um usually if I'm, I'm using my allocation money to buy down contracts that means that i've got like this epic squad right so um so that's what I, that's kind of the deal, you know, with my squad wise since our the last video. Um, I have had a few players, and I've got all the player statuses over here, who have come to me complaining about contracts, and I don't play games with that um, unless you're young. I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you be a cancer in the locker room. So as soon as somebody has a problem with contracts or playing time, I list them for the transfer market. So I've already got like Leonardo's listed, Remick is listed, uh, Cabezas wanted a new contract. Certainly not going to offer a contract to somebody in their, you know, on this, on the wrong side of 25. Um, unless they're like really, really good. Um, but Cabezas, I feel like he's making 180,000. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give him much more than that because he's not worth it. Um, Kyoto listed him even. He's one of my better players. Um, Marky Delgado came to me, I believe, I think about playing time. So I listed him. Listed Seren, who wanted playing time. Uh, Alvarez was listed. Although I think I listed him before just because he's old. I was trying to move him. Uh, Pena, Ronaldo Pena came to me wanting a new contract. Now he's only 20, so I may end up giving him one. He's only making 105000 Um So this probably, this offseason will be the time to give him a contract. But I am, as you can tell, I was right at the salary cap. I can't be giving out big contracts because then I'm going to have to be using more allocation money, right? So that's why in MLS you have to be careful with the contracts you give out. So Pena listed. Um, Archer listed. Um, well, Garcia was already listed because he's terrible. Bird is terrible, so I listed him. So as you can see, that's I'm just kind of going showing you that how... How I operate, um, squad-wise, right? I <clears throat> it's very rare that I give a player a third contract, right? I'll I'll immediately sign them, right? The the first contract, I may give them a second contract, but 
not a third. If you come try to get a third contract from me, I'm I'm listing you. I'm I'm selling you, and I'm going to get you know try and get value for you. Uh, Benfica did come to me for Pena, but he, he you look at his value. He's now valued at four point seven million. At the time Benfica came in, it was like three point three, and I knew his value was going to be climbing because well I play him quite a bit, and he scores goals. Look, he's got fifteen goals. Um, so. <clears throat> Benfica came to me with an offer of the initial offer was eight hundred and fifty thousand and I'm not gonna play around with that. There was a lot of like incentives, like when he hits ten games it adds another f- seventy five thousand. So um but they also didn't allow me to negotiate. It was one of those non negotiable offers. And I don't I'm not gonna no. If you're not gonna if if you're not gonna negotiate with me unless you come in with a massive offer, we're not we're not having a discussion. So I rejected Benfica um, and partly because I didn't like the offer, and I am I'm not super deep at at the, my front three right now, so I've got you know Kyoto, Manotas, and Elise. They're my front three, my starting front three. I do have Pena, I have Alvarez, but then I drop down to winger, <coughs> who is injured right now. Um, I have Eric Bird, but he's just terrible. I even had even in one of my games I played with a. Um, I went with a strikerless formation so that I could put Quixote, or Martinez at the that center striker on the. I did a it was a three four three, four three three, but I dropped the striker back to the AMC position just because I'm. It was kind of a fatigue situation. I don't like starting guys below ninety five percent, and so. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the squad deal. Um, tactically and not. You know, just to look at, well, we'll real quick look at dynamics. Um, match cohesion is, is not getting, well, it's not as, I may because I've tinkered a little bit with my tactics recently, but the cohesion is not as good as I would like it to be. Um, locker room atmosphere is up to very good. Um, <sighs> hierarchy is, I, I would like to have another team leader, um, and nobody's really emerging for that. My hope is that Alton Top slides up there. Um, social groups, not terrible, right? Uh, I've only got two in this bottom and the others group, and that's partly because Orhuela just came in, um, and Donovan was on loan for a while, so probably those guys are going to slide up pretty quick. Um, but you know, it's good when your top two groups are are big, right? Um, happiness, m- m- any unhappiness that I have, it mostly deals with training right most of them are satisfied with training but there are some who are concerned and then there's a couple who don't like their playing time um but even they are content except for garcia who garcia is not going to get playing time for me because he's not good um artur he's i brought him in right i he was a um I brought him in on a. I think we we discussed Artur in a previous video. I'm pretty sure we did. I, I he was a waiver. I signed him off of waivers from Columbus. He had an issue settling in Houston, so I gave him like a month long leave. He has recently come back, um, but I'm guessing that's partly to you know why his unhappiness is there. Tactically, um, I made a few changes here and there to my you know my whatever my tactics. Um, I have increased the mentality because I feel like I needed more balls going forward, right? I needed to take a little more risk going forward. Um, I did, I tried to, I maintained the balance a little bit, tried to establish balance by, I reduced, I dropped the defensive line a little bit, and I also lowered closing down a little bit, um, and I lowered the tempo. Um, and so far, so good. It's worked out. Um I, well, and, and I also did a. I've done this before. I did a, you know, put in what I call a three-four-three. That's obviously not the formation, but um, it works as the three-four-three because Alton Top the, or, or whoever's playing defensive mid, it's a halfback, so he drops back into the back line with the two center backs, so that they and the center backs widen out. He say it creates a three-four-three look. Um, and I use that when I play against two strikers. That's actually the tactic I use to win the, well, to play in the Open Cup Final, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, and yeah, so my changes have had a pretty good result. I, you know, I, I, I hit this, like, 
period of sort of dead period here where I really wasn't getting what I wanted. So I started those changes um, really kind of after that New York game. Um, I didn't really, I just didn't feel like I was creating enough. <clears throat> and as you can see, you know, it's hit and miss. Um, but a lot of these, a lot of the poor results, like the Galaxy, that's my second team, right? When I lost at home to the Galaxy because I was saving my first team for the Open Cup match against Portland, which was a success. I won that game. Um, then played my second team at Real Salt Lake, and it worked brilliantly there with my cha tactical changes. Then I go at Colorado, and I played my second. Well, it was, I guess it is my first team. That's one where I get scored on with set pieces, um, which if you guys have any ideas on defending set pieces, please post links in the comments. I hate defending set pieces. I have not been able to find a... Corner kicks, I think I've sort of figured that out a little bit, right? Um, but free kicks, and that's where the Colorado goals came from. Uh, free kicks I, is frustrating. Um, and it may just be my guys, my players, right? Um, you know, when, when you build a, a team to be passing, you know, be a passing and possession team, it probably does hurt your set pieces a little bit because typically those guys are shorter, they're not as great in the air. And so, I don't know. I mean, it could just be I need to upgrade my players. Um, but, because I, I mean, I probably concede half my goals at least in set pieces. Uh, and I don't concede a lot. So um, anyway, help me with set pieces if you can. <laughs> so then after the Colorado game, though, I had this big, long layoff. So you see Colorado was uh, August the 12th. And then my next league game was September 9th. So that's almost a month. Um, and it wasn't like the league took off that month. There was other games going on. It's just for whatever reason, I was on buys that long. Um, probably might have had to do with like Dallas. I don't remember this happening, but... Dallas played in the International Champions Cup, and there's a lot of games in a short period, so it could have been that that game got moved. Um, but for whatever reason, I had a month off, so I decided to go get a couple friendlies um, to keep my guys fit. I played a local NPSL team, which is a semi-pro, um, and we dominated that game. Scored five goals in the first half with my first team, and then my second team just farted around the second half and didn't do anything, but whatever. Uh, so then I got a game, though, against AC Milan, um, a friendly, and it was I was looking for a big name team, make a little money, right? And this one made me three hundred thousand. Uh, and even after, well, that was before I even set right. When you when you just pick a friendly, it tells you how much you're gonna make from each one. And so I picked my, Milan, and then I got another eighty thousand dollars because it, the, the TV deal, right? TV company, whatever, picked it up. And so um, so we played AC Milan national TV, and I. Um, well, I, I controlled the game. It was, I was, we'll go and look. I scored right away, sixth minute, Minotas goal, and I'm all excited because I'm like, oh, I'm going to win this. Like, I originally just, it was really just to kind of make a little money while keeping my guys fit. Um, I never expected to have a chance. So, and we're, and we're controlling the game, and then Milan scores on a set piece. Pretty sure it was a free kick, um, and ties it at one. So... My original plan in the game was I'm going to sub everybody out at halftime because I'm not really trying to get a result anyway, just trying to keep everybody fit. I even wanted my second team to be fit. So, but but it's it's tied, right? We're tied 1-1 at halftime, and I'm like, man, I really want to win this game. So I left my first team in, and, and we're creating chances. I mean, you look, we had one clear, two half. Um, we're holding the ball 60%, you know, and... The highlights were, were all me, right? It was feeling like I had a goal coming, right? You know how it goes in FM, right? All the highlights are you. You're just you're waiting to score. And it got to the 70th minute, and I hadn't scored, and I was like, well, I can't I can't play my first team the whole 90. You know, somebody's gonna get hurt. I, you know, and I I need my second team guys to get you know to get a run out. So about the 70th minute, I sub in the second team. Milan comes down, scores on a set piece, of course and take the lead and then they added one in the 90th and so I lose so it was a game that I really feel like I could have won it was encouraging in a way because it I had been making some tactical changes and this game tells me that I what I'm doing is working to the point where I can when I get my squad built I can 
I can hold my own a little bit against some of these better teams. Um, now, Milan obviously is not Chelsea. It's not Manchester City, right? Um, but they're still a good team. They actually won one of the um, Champions Cups. We'll go and look at it. Um, find it here. Yeah, International Champions Cup. So they won the Australia version. Um, which, well, obviously is not... So, you know, hey, they had Mar uh, Arsenal, they had Atletico, PSG, Benfica. Um, they won, they beat Arsenal in the final. So, you know, they, they obviously are still a good team, and I should have won the game. So, um, so anyway, that was a fun little thing. Um, then, yes, play Vancouver. And this was another good encouraging result because this was my second team, right? These were these were mostly second teamers because I wanted to keep my guys fresh for the Oval Cup final, which was Dallas, and I did get a win. Um, yeah, Martinez and Elise. It was a game. It was. I mean, you look at the. Um, this was I was playing. You know, you see that three four three tactic. Um, it still needs some tweaking, I think, and it may be that I end up just getting rid of it altogether. But um, it definitely helped with possession, right? You see the possession, and partly that's how Dallas plays. Um, which interestingly, FC Dallas is now managed by Dominic Kinnear, who is was the Dynamo's first manager. He won two game or two championships with the Dynamo, and so now he's with FC Dallas. So that adds a little bit to the rivalry. But um, yeah, dominated possession, but they were able to create more chances than I w would want them to, and it may be just because of the way the, the shape is, and so it may just be not workable. Um, I don't know. I, I need to play with it some more, but um, yeah, so we won the Open Cup, so, which is good, and you know, I, I win the Open Cup more often than I lose it just because of how I handled it, and FC Dallas had played a game that weekend, and so they rolled out a team that wasn't fully fit whereas my team was so that obviously gave me an advantage um, I also played it at home you know so that helped um, so we were the champs then we turned around played our second team against Dallas and we tied <laughs> so um, anyway that's how the results have gone looking at the league uh, I am obviously leading in the Western Conference up by seven points which is pretty safe uh, when you got five to play, um, I don't want to be too risky, but you know I'll probably use these last five games to keep everybody fresh, do a lot of rotating, um, try and you know because you never know when when injuries are going to hit. It seems like every year in the playoffs I get hit with injuries that that kill me, so uh, I need to have guys at least fit and ready to go. Um, but when and then you look at the supporter shield, which is the overall, it's all the teams in both conferences. Um, I'm up there by three points over TFC, which Toronto FC, probably the best team in the league, talent-wise, squad-wise. But what's surprising is New York City, all the way down at eighth. Um, they're not bad, but they're struggling. Um, so uh, I, I feel like New York City, they may have the best squad in the league, truth be told. they, they Them in Toronto are possibly the two best teams when you look they've got guys like david via maxi morales um that's a really really good team but they're not getting the results and so they're sitting in eighth i think that i think they're still in the playoffs yeah they're fifth um so they're probably in seven points clear but um they're all the way down to eighth in the um in the league or in the supporter shield <clears throat> atlanta united is another team that they are just, they're loaded. I kind of reckon that Atlanta United is going to end up winning the East. Um, and they'll probably be the team that makes it to the MLS Cup Final. So if, if I get there, that's probably who I'm going to face. It seems like in the early part of the game, Atlanta United just, I mean, they just run rampant through the league. Um, so that's happening. And you're looking at the relegation battle, it, Orlando is going down probably. All the well, they're close. It's between them, Montreal, DC United. There's quite the relegation battle going right there. As that eleventh spot, you've got what four teams are within one point of it. So that'll be an intense battle to watch in the East. In the West, it's probably Vancouver, probably LAFC. 
Um, going down to the NASL to look at the teams battling for promotion, who I might be seeing next year. We've got in the East, Cincinnati. <clears throat> no big surprise there. Um, and then the next three, you got Miami FC, Puerto Rico, North Carolina. And the way it works in this save is that the um, two of those four are going to be promoted. The The team that wins that first playoff round gets promoted. So, um, so there you go. In the West, you got a fascinating battle there going on. I mean, the four teams that are in have pretty much locked it up, right? Nashville, San Antonio, Phoenix, and Sacramento. They've locked up that top four pretty much. So it'll be two of those four. Um, all right. Um, yeah, I thought maybe we'd look at World Cup qualifying, but the video is kind of going long. So um, let's real quick um, we'll start the All Star game. <clears throat> and, you know, I'll skip through a little bit. I'll just. Uh, Something does happen early. So this was um, what I did when usually when you, when I do the All Star game, what you've seen is I'll just use my tactics with the All Star team. But um, I kind of felt like that's not I don't want to say it's not realistic, but I'm not going to have time to familiarize the MLS All Stars with the tactic. Right, and that's how it works. You you get the MLS All Stars, but there's no way to establish familiarity, tactical familiarity. So I said, you know what, forget it. <clears throat> I'm gonna look at what I have, the players that I have, and I'm going to pick. You see, and Sampdoria scores immediately, right? Um, right away, and they're up one nothing, and I get mad and skip the highlights. So, um, and then Dos Santos gets injured, and so I get even more mad, <clears throat> and I'll skip this. Um, so. I decided to look at the players that I have, the MLS All-Stars, and I'm going to pick a formation, and I'm going to pick roles that work best, right? I'm just going to simplify everything. And so that's what I did. And um, I, I did kind of base it off my tactic a little bit, right? Like the team instructions. I used most of my team instructions. Um, I'm going to skip some here. And the truth is, the roster was really front heavy. Like I did, I only had two center backs. And normally, what I do with the All Stars is I, I play the first eleven, the first half, and then sub everybody at halftime. <clears throat> but with only two center backs, you know, it was kind of a tough to figure out what to do. So I had I had a couple defensive midfielders, <laughs> and so I played uh, two defensive midfielders at center back in the second half. Um, so because I was so front heavy, I just went with a four three three narrow, and um, yeah, that's pick the roles that work best for each guy. Um, I'm like, I think is this the? No, I think maybe it's the next. Oh, let's go back. Yeah, so um, this was the equalizer, and Sampdoria is not the. Um, well, Vanderbilt to first of all, GMV go to Villa, and we're level. <clears throat> so Sampdoria is not the most high rep team that, you, that I've had to play in the MLS All-Star game. They're not at Man City. They're not at Man United. They're not Arsenal or Chelsea. Um, they're not Real Madrid. Um, but it's still a challenging opponent. You know, they're a club, so they can get tactical familiarity. And they had gone through most of their preseason, so they were mostly fit. Um, and I'm just going to skip ahead a little more here. And this was just me subbing everybody at halftime. We don't need to see all that. <clears throat> and I don't remember when I... One thing that Sam Doria did, and as you can see, they at halftime they changed their formation to a 4-4-2 box midfield, which that's one I used to use in FM. Um... But I don't know, around FM10 or 11, it really became hard to to create a 442 box that worked. So, and my real life, um, you know, my real life coaching changed. Uh, I I went to more of a in real life where I you know coaching my youth teams. I, I went with a more of a 433, uh, and it's because of where U.S. Soccer is going. Right, um, I wanted to get on board uh, with you know the direction of development in the in in our country. So I you know changed what I did and um, so I left the box midfield in real life. So I left it in FM. 
I haven't really done it in a while. And if a lot of people, and if you know me at all around the FM community, which you probably don't, but a few years ago I created a whole, um, well, a big thread on SI about the box midfield, and that's what if anyone does know me, that's what they would know me from. I'm not like a community legend or anything like that. So, um, but I saw him do this, and it kind of made me want to try it again. Because one thing that FM has done is they've added some roles, like the Segundo Volante. That is a, um, or Volante, uh, <clears throat> that's a Brazilian term for the second defensive midfielder. And that's kind of how most Brazilian teams operate. They have one defensive midfielder that, that sort of acts as the first option for the back line. And then they have the second defensive midfielder, or the Segundo Volante, who steps forward a little bit. <clears throat> and he links he links from the back line in the first defensive mid to your attacking midfielders, your Mayas. And so um and so now that there's a Segundo Volante and I feel like I could maybe get it to work with the Mazala role at attacking mid because that's always was the problem. That's what became the problem in FM is that the two attacking midfielders in the four four two box mid didn't function properly. That you couldn't get them to to explore the space, sideline to center field. And then there's Barco to get me the winner. Um, and yeah, I immediately go contain. I'm gonna try and hold this thing. Um, and, I, and, and I did. So we, we ended up winning two to one. Um, I'll go ahead and cycle through the end because I do make some changes here to try and um, hold the lead. Yeah, there's even going to um, my opposition instructions, blah, blah, blah. So we'll just let that be it. Um, so yeah, maybe in the future I'll do a, um, a box midfield um, series. I'm creating a box midfield, trying to make see if I can get the old 442 box to work. Uh, maybe I can, you know, maybe I would be able to, but um, I like what I'm doing right now. You know, I like, I like training my club, getting my club to all function to make this style of play work. Um, and so, and, you know, operating in the transfer market, it is, it is easier, <clears throat> it's easier to, s I'll say this, I'm trying to think of how to describe it. So the 442 box midfield worked a lot because you, it, it reduced the, the, like, okay, with the 433, you got to think about, uh, developing wingers. You got to develop, uh, a, a playmaker, and an attacking midfielder, and you got to develop wingers that play as inside forwards. Um, box midfield, defensive mids, attacking mids. It made training easier. Um, but anyway, um, I'll save that for the future. Obviously, I, I'm definitely thinking about it. <laughs> so, uh, looking at the head, I've got five more games left before the playoffs start. Um, what I'll probably do is I'll record my playoff games and then if I make it to the MLS Cup final maybe we'll do a com on that um, but things are going well um, first place won the Open Cup um, injuries are hitting a little bit so my depth is being challenged but um, and this is well this is we're pretty close to where we wanted to be because when we start when you start with the Dynamo you don't start as one of the best teams you start down in the lower half and so the fact that I've been able to um, bring in a couple guys here and there that have propelled me to where I am is good, but that's FM, right? So if you have any comments, any criticisms, any suggestions, um, please post those, um, and I will see you next time.